with the exception of our passage from Thessalonians, we are hearing scripture today that's just in the middle of a lot of stuff. And so to try to unpack some of that, I'll kind of go through the, the passages that we read in our lectures today, uh, one by one. So we may wonder, as we approach Moses speaking with God, what in the world is he complaining about? He's still seeking the presence of God. God has been with him all this time. God of the burning bush, the plagues, the parting of the sea, the cloud and the fire leading them along, the water in the rock, the manna. Oh, and wait, there's more. Isn't that enough? Well, the context. Just before this passage in Exodus, God has told Moses he's done with this people. They're hard-headed and impossible, and they can go on their way. Thank you very much. So Moses, again and again and again, is one of the characters in the Bible that, well, changes God's mind. And that's where we get the passage today in his rather convoluted argument system, he keeps coming back to, you know, how can I do this on my own? I'm just poor Moses, and the Moses, of course, who changes God's mind. I'm just poor Moses, and these are your people, and what's the world going to think if you abandon your people? What have they done that's so bad that God was going to abandon them? Well, back there in chapter 32, that was Moses up on the mountain, gone for so long that the poor Israelites just were so worried that they took all their gold and melted it and made this beautiful calf. And they fell down and there was God. In other words, a graven image they worshipped an idol, not the living God. This was when Moses came down with the tablets. And what happened to that first set of tablets? Wham! They broke into pieces. Well, what happened to the gold, we may ask, I ended up drinking it. And several other rather unpleasant things happened as well. So I guess we could say in this mixed bag of justice and mercy, uh, there was a lot of both. But Moses is here able to convince God to go with God's chosen people. And God makes some particular limitations on how he will do uh, this. So again, after all the great things God has done, when are we going to be satisfied? Do we keep asking, well, Lord, what have you done for me lately? God is always with us, always will be. It's up to us to keep in mind this is part of the purpose of sacred scripture, to keep in mind God's great acts in our history. Now, by contrast, in the epistle, Paul is pretty thrilled with those people in Thessalonica. They have gone out beyond their original uh, evangelism, and as Paul uh, and uh, uh, Silas, is it, um, have gone out to the next town, they've arrived thinking, well, we're going to have to start from scratch, but the people there had already heard the gospel, had already heard the good news. And so it was thanks to this group of, of the evangelized, those followers of Jesus, who had taken up the message and spread it out even before Paul was able to get there. How'd they do that? Well, Yes, Paul's very happy with them, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says. And so without Paul being there, the Holy Spirit takes the followers and leads them on to do the work that's needed to be done. Next week, if you're over at Jump, you'll be hearing our presiding bishop talk about this Jesus movement. This is what the Thessalonians were all about. The Jesus movement. It wasn't about being Episcopalians or even being Christians. 
It was about the power of the Holy Spirit and the life of Jesus that was right there before them that they were sharing the good news in a pure form. And so, yes, we are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, but as our presiding bishop will tell us, it's that movement, that action, that getting out all around the world about Jesus and living the life of Jesus, that's the import, not about anything else, ultimately. So, in our gospel... We pick up Jesus in the midst of his temple ministry, we might say. He's done the triumphal entry. He's back at Jerusalem, and this is uh, quite a bit in Matthew before we have uh, the, the passion narrative. And so he has parables, he has healings, he has arguments, and um, so today we get an argument. Now he's come into the temple, and first thing he did was knock over all the, the tables and the cellars and everything, and kick their money into the gutter and make quite a to-do. And they ask him right away, well, by whose authority do you come into the temple and act this way? Whose authority? And he's upset, shall we say, those temple people, not happy with him. So... Um, he's gone back to Bethany, he's come back to the temple, this we could say is day two or whatever, but there he is at the temple. And um, the authorities are after him. They're, they're trying to put him up to the public and show him for some kind of a sham. I mean, they're the ones with all the authority. They've been installed in the temple ministry. Where has he been come, where has he come from? Galilee, wherever that is. So they're gonna see if they can, with all their power, uh, put him to the test. Now, part of the background is that we should know here he is at the temple, and the temple is a special we have the 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 temple of the Gentiles and the temple for the women and the temple, and you keep going inside and inside until that one holy of holies that only the the priest, Zechariah, for example, can get into one time a year. So it's always inside, inside, inside. So they're, they're fairly well into the temple. And when Jesus knocked over the, the tables of the sellers, it was because they were exchanging Roman money for temple money, because Roman money was bad news. You couldn't have that. You weren't supposed to deal with it. So there they are in the midst of the temple. And who all is in there with them? It isn't just this band of temple people that get along and are opposing Jesus. It's the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, these people don't get along. The Pharisees are the pure. These are the, these are the good Jews. They do everything right. And I know we like to put them down and and give thanks to the Lord that we're not like those Pharisees, but that's not the point. The Pharisees are good people. But they don't like the Herodians because the Herodians are the conspirators with Rome in the ruling of the country. Herod is the, the puppet king there in Israel, and the Herodians are the ones that fill his bureaucracies. And so the Pharisees want purely God's kingdom and God's people in charge of their holy land. And the Herodians are, are conspirators with the enemy. Anyway, they come together because they're going to get this Jesus. So, here's this question. Shall we pay taxes to the emperor? Yes or no? Just give me a clear yes or no. I mean, how much do we like those questions? We get our politicians up there. You know, come on, quit equivocating yes or no. And I don't care how complicated the issue is, we want a yes or no answer. And then when they don't give it, what do we say? Well, you know, flip-flopping, you know, they won't, they won't speak the truth. But here Jesus, right in front of us, is not giving a yes or no answer. Now, of course, the Herodians and the Pharisees with this big group think they've got him. You know, if, 
If he says, go ahead and pay the taxes, all the people that Jesus is impressed, all the people who he's shown his authority, his ultimate God-given authority to, are going to be going, no, it's, it's wrong to pay taxes. It's wrong to uphold Caesar. We're God's country. This is the, supposed to be the kingdom. So only, only by supporting the kingdom can we do what God wants us to do. Of course, the other side, if he says, well, no, don't pay your taxes to Caesar. Well, the temple guards who are in league with the Romans are right there, and he's gone right away. His ministry is finished because he can be arrested. Now, that's sedition. That's treason. You've got to pay taxes to Caesar. And if you tell anybody not to do so, uh, well... You're, you're going to jail. So yes or no isn't going to work very well. So here we go then. And this is the next little trick. So how do we pay taxes to Caesar, he says. But show me a coin. And we can just imagine all of them reaching in their pocket and getting out their denariuses in the middle of the temple where the Caesar's coins are illegal and unholy. That's like, shouldn't they be going, oh, oh, uh, I don't really have any denariuses, do I? So Jesus says, fine, takes it up. Whose head is on there? The emperor's. Whose title? What's his title? Emperor. Okay, so give it back to the emperor then. It's his. Kind of end of story of the question, but Jesus does go on with the sermon, give to God the things that are God's. Now, unpack it one more little bit. The actual language says, whose head, whose icon is on this coin? In whose likeness is this coin? Okay, whose image is this? And whose likeness? So biblical scholars, image, likeness. Where have we heard that phrase put together? Image, likeness? Well, we don't want to make a graven image. But let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 26. I looked it up. <laughs> Chapter 1, <laughs> verse 26. We are created in God's image, in his likeness. So, let's just look at the story again. Here's the coin, give it back to Caesar. Give back to God the image and likeness that belongs to God. What's the image and likeness that belongs to God? Well, turn to your neighbor. I'm looking at you. Turn to your neighbor. Okay? It's us. Give back to God what belongs to God. That's right here, you and me. So we sometimes take these lessons of, well, you know, um, we're going to give to the government, and, and Paul supports the government as well. We're, we're not necessarily insurrectionists, but we, we want to say, well, it's just right, you know, you got to support the government. And, or tip the tithe. Well, 10%, that's good, you know, wash my hands, I've done my 10%. Now I'm getting on with my life. So, what do we give back to God? What belongs to God? That's everything. That's every single thing. There isn't this breakdown of, well, we got Caesars over here, we got God's over here, we just have to work out which way to go. Mm -mm. It all belongs to God. So, instead of a false dichotomy, we do have to live in this complicated world. I mean, there's no easy answer about what we're supposed to give and what we're supposed to do. And yes, we need to recognize, I mean, even for the Romans, they brought back good roads and the mail was on time, okay? even though they had to smack down a few people to do it. Good government is important. It's part of the way that we can live and worship and, and have the freedom to enjoy the life that God provides for us. But we remember that everything we do, 
whatever we give back to the government is giving back to God ultimately. And that 90% that we maybe think is just ours isn't. Okay. So, give to God the things that are God's. Give the image and likeness of the things that are God's back to God. May we do that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.